Rich, thank you for joining me today. The District of Columbia Public Library is the public library system for DC. And as the executive director of DC Public Libraries, your system includes 26 individual libraries that many see as social places for families to come together and engage with um, learning in sort of a hub style. So why are libraries so unique to communities in DC? And what are you hoping that families will get out of their experience in your libraries? Cool, well, first of all, Michelle, um, it's great to be here. Um, talking to a fellow Stuyvesant High School um, alumni. So uh, props to the peg legs um, who are representing in DC. And, um, and I should say that it's been great supporting the work of our charter schools um, for as long as I've been here, which is now eight years. And I'm happy to uh, um, you know, have this talk with you and, and address your questions and talk about the future. Um, you know, very generally in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, why libraries are unique to the communities in DC. I mean, you think of museums as being sort of anchors in, in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, there are few, if any, places that people can go to um, that is free, that is welcoming to all, that provides people at all stages of their life, something. Um, you know, for us, maybe you and me growing up, that was a book. And for now, for now, for, for, for young adults and children, it could be um, a space that they can game in or um, spaces in which they can uh, do some sort of programming. Uh, so, you know, residents in DC have fallen in love with their neighborhood libraries because the city has invested so much money into their neighborhood libraries. I mean, this is a, um, it's a simple equation. If you put a lot of money into something, um, the result is typically gonna be pretty good. So we've got these just, you know, I'd say almost 20, almost ooh, almost all of our libraries, I should say, are, are brand new or they're right. fully renovated. So they're not the libraries that you and I grew up in. They've got spaces for people to convene, um, outdoor spaces for people to hang out. You know, we're not very prescriptive about having to be quiet. We want, you know, and I'll, I'll probably stress this a lot in our conversation is that they're places for people to have fun. And so, um, you know, what families love about libraries, you know, it depends really on this, on the age of their kids. But I know that, you know, parents of our youngest, um, of our toddlers or our preschoolers, you know, they love that there's just that one place that they can go to every Tuesday and Friday to get a story time program or their caregivers can yeah. go for yeah. a story time program. They love that on Saturdays, they know that they can walk by the library and, you know, maybe there's a program going on, but if not, hey, why don't you just go borrow a couple of books just so we can have for the weekend or for um, this week that we're all off from school or something like that. So it's just, you know, in every neighborhood, the library offers some possibility. And I think that, that, that families in DC love that there is just that something, we might not be front of mind at all times, but there's something that you can rely on um, at, your, at, your, at your neighborhood library. And I think that joy, it's, um, it's optimism, it's uh, safety, which you alluded to earlier. And then it's like, you know, it's a weird thing. It's like, you know, hey, um, there's a pandemic going on. How can we leverage our libraries to uh, provide families access to COVID tests? and yeah. spaces where they can drop them off. So it's just it's just that it's a reliable space with trusted individuals. Um, and it just, you know, it, it just makes you feel good that it's there, it really does. Yeah. Well, now that we know how libraries um, impact communities, we're eager to hear about the goals for the rest of this year, 2022. Can you talk to us about any new initiatives that you plan to implement this year to engage students and families and, Hint, hint, are there any plans to create more libraries in schools similar to DC Prep, um, PCS on Benning Road? Um, well, you've asked them many questions and I'll, <laughs> I'll, let, me, let me compartmentalize them a little bit. So, you know, one of, my, one of my very basic goals, Michelle, for 2022 is getting people back to our library. Now, yeah. things that we are not, we are not any way near um, uh, back to normal in terms of 
um, in terms of visits, right? In terms of yeah. uh, our gate count, in terms of the number of people coming into our building, we're probably less than half of where we were back in 2019. So, um, so rebuilding trust is a big thing that we're trying to do. Um, you know, we've invested a lot of our um, American Rescue Plan Act funding um, mm -hmm. in uh, advanced um, air circulating systems. Right. And so you'll walk into even our new branches, you know, every indoor physical space um, can use a little bit of help. So we are doing better in terms of air handling and just giving people that sense of confidence that, you know, it's okay for me to go to a program uh, with this kid who I don't know because the libraries are safe. Um, the HVAC systems are new. They're turning the air over very quickly. And that's a big thing. I mean, if we don't establish that, that foundational trust, then all the cool programming in the world is not going to, um, is not going to matter because, uh, because people won't be going. But beyond that, um, we've got a few things going on. Um, certainly, you mentioned, you know, are there opportunities for new libraries and new spaces? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, we still have a very aggressive capital improvement and capital building program. So uh, you mentioned um, DC Benning Prep. Uh, we are kicking off a new project in FY23 for a new library in the Deanwood neighborhood, which is not far uh, from Benning. Um, we've got plans for a new library in Chevy Chase. Uh, but so getting more people uh, raising awareness of all the services that we've got in the MLK library is a big part of what we're doing in 2022. Um, while the building is newly renovated, it is also celebrating its 50th birthday. So we've been having 50th birthday events and uh, reopening events that will bring families down because once they're down, they get, they get hooked. Yes. Not just with the spaces for kids and teens, not just the, the playground slide that takes people down from the second floor to the first floor, but, you know, just things like, you know, our emerging technologies, uh, our older students love that, that, you know, we've got a studio space where they can uh, uh, rehearse, um, that we've got uh, trained staff that can help them understand how to use some of the high tech uh, equipment that we've got in the library. Um, the fact that we've got these really rich um, DC history collections. I know that a lot of students, I think students in all of our charter schools also um, do DC history the way they Absolutely. do in DC public schools. The way we're approaching DC history is very unique. It's focused a lot on the culture, like go-go music, um, DC punk rock scene. But in schools, we talk a lot about social and emotional learning. Yes. And I think that there's a lot of that self-directed learning that you can do in libraries. And I think kids are just surprised at how great and, um, and fun and interesting it can be without necessarily being sort of didactic, you know? Well, you're definitely on topic for our discussion because this month we are highlighting quality teaching and learning strategies, both inside and out of the classroom. So you just laid out a number of ways that the library is supporting students outside of the classroom. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ways that you are supporting educators inside of the classroom. Um, yeah, you bet. Um, you know, we've been, we've been thinking and working with um, teachers in the district for a long time. Um, you know, years ago, we, um, we uh, created something that we call an educator card. So okay. this is a like a, a souped up um, DC public library card that we only give to teachers in the district. And that card unlocks a lot of the great treasures that the library has. It gives teachers access to many more books than you would ordinarily be able to borrow as a, um, um, as a district resident. It also connects you to resources that our um, librarians offer. So really important that we offer, Michelle, and we've been doing more of this every single year, is um, you know, we, we license or buy so many electronic resources, databases yeah. that our teachers can use in the classroom, or they can help us encourage parents and um, kids to use it outside the classroom. So, uh, for example, we um, license a great product called BrainFuse, and BrainFuse offers live homework help uh, to students across all ages. It's a pretty well-used product, um, 
um, but it's not getting as much use as I would like it to get used. And so we work with teachers on promoting things like brain views and a whole host of other electronic databases. Again, a lot of it is learning based. So let's say learning languages or help with languages. Some of it is sort of ge uh, generic encyclopedic stuff. But you know, some of it, frankly, again, is also you know, fun and interesting things that, um, that families may not know libraries provide, like, um, um, like a, a, um, a streaming service called Canopy. Canopy is like, a, uh, um, it's like Netflix, but with much more, I would say, an educational bent in mind. Um, so films, documentaries, if you want to learn about, let's say, like Alma Thomas or somebody like that, you can uh, go on to this great resource and there will be probably, you know, an hour long documentary on Alma Thomas that was done in 1983 that kids can look at. So there's a lot that we offer that we try to get into the, into the classrooms themselves. And if not, we hope that our teachers are gonna work with us uh, to promote this material to our students uh, when they get home, provided of course they've got access at home. And we know over the course of the pandemic, um, Access is still a challenge for many of our students and many of our families. And so one thing, and I'm deviating a little bit from- Oh no, teacher, please, <laughs> please. Maybe this is less of a teacher resource, but um, over the next few months, uh, DC Public Library is working with the city's chief, chief technology officer uh, to distribute uh, 10,000 um, connected devices. Wow. And we're, yeah, it's gonna be a massive infusion of devices that. Um, that will be paid for, including the internet access for at least a period of time, hopefully a year or change. And uh, we hope that that is going to solve at least, you know, part of the transactional problem of people not having access. I know that schools have done a great job in terms of getting students there, uh, maybe a laptop, uh, maybe a hotspot, but, you know, sometimes that's just not enough for a family. So we're hoping that this additional infusion of devices could go in and support uh, parents who may need devices. Right. Um, uh, you know, an easier way to connect with their 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 students, an easier way. Uh, I'm sorry, their their uh, students' teachers, and um, and so that's going to be a big big lift for us uh, between now probably and uh, July or so. Oh. Yeah. So uh, so there's a lot between educator cards, e-resources, class visits, um, and a few of the other things I mentioned. We're always thinking hard about ways in which we can support uh, teachers better in and out. Well, you've shared a lot about how DCPL creates an environment that promotes learning across uh, DC students, both public charter and uh, traditional public. So as one executive director to another, I am curious, uh, what is the most rewarding part of your job? Um, boy, you know, I've got to say, I love my job a, a lot. And a lot of the job is very rewarding. Um, you know, going to a community meeting on a Wednesday night in January um, <laughs> can be a lot of fun when we're talking to residents about uh, maybe a new library project or something like that. But I guess if, if I had to answer very quickly without giving it a ton of thought, you know, over the past eight years, because the city has been so generous with the, um, with the expansion and rebuilding of libraries across the city, there has been been very little as rewarding as um, you know standing um, with the mayor, um, members of my board, um, maybe a classroom of students opening um, a beautiful new library building in a community that maybe for the past 30 or 40 years has had something that has been you know less than spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, and just going back to my eight years, uh, back through my eight years, in addition to the Martin Luther King Library, um, you know, I've opened libraries um, uh, in Ward 6, the Southwest Library, in Ward 7, the Capitol View Library, in Ward 3, the um, Cleveland Park Library, in Ward 2, the West End Library, the Palisades Library, in Ward 3 again, and every one of these events is spectacular because they're the result of, at the very least, three or four years of work. Mm -hmm. 
And the, um, if you do it right, what you get from, from your neighbors and, and the people who live in the community is just, you know, their chins drop to the floor and they're like, you know, I cannot believe that this, this beautiful museum-like resource is available, not just for me, but my kids and my friends. And they'll be available for my kids' kids if they stick around the neighborhood. They're just these anchors of community learning. Um, and, you know, again, provided you've done it right and provided there's been the sufficient level of engagement so that residents who participated in the process see some of what they've offered in terms of their comment in the end result, um, nothing is more satisfying than adding this physical anchor um, to a community that has maybe been deprived of one for a long time, knowing what it means to them and the appreciation they show is just um, is just overwhelming. So that's definitely the most rewarding part of my job. There are others um, for sure, but um, but boy, that's 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 that one takes the cake. Wow, wow. <laughs> Well, um, it has been really exciting talking about all of the ways that um, the library has done work and is intending to do work. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that I didn't ask maybe? Um, no, but I mean, I just wanna say um, how grateful I am, Michelle, that you're in DC. Um, one of the things that's important for me uh, in order to be successful in my job is to rely on, on, on my partners in DC government, especially to help get the word out about everything that we're doing. You know, helping amplify what we're doing in the library is a huge, huge benefit to us. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to our tenure here together. Yes, absolutely. Um, it has been a pleasure, you know, participating in meetings with you and being part of the deputy mayor's uh, cluster conversations. And I, not just in this interview, definitely feel your passion around this work. And as we've been talking about, learning does happen in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And there's so many hours in the day that we could be providing just robust and wonderful options uh, for our young people. And as yep. we have adult charter schools all the way up to our adult population as well. Um, so really appreciate your leadership, Rich, and um, the work that you have done and will continue to do to support um, this cause for sure. Awesome, Michelle. Well, thanks. It was great talking to you here. Yeah, same, same. Have a wonderful afternoon. All right. Bye. Yeah.